Hey, what's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today we are going to be looking at something that I was really personally interested in and still am, may even use it in a future home theater upgrade. That is the JBL Synthesis SCL6. There's a lot of sibilance in that sentence. Hope it doesn't take your ears off. That's why I use a de -esser. All right. Anyway, let's get on with the review. I want to first give you a sense of scale of the speaker because honestly, I thought it was going to be larger. So when I got it in, I was, if I'm being honest, I'm a little bit disappointed that it was smaller. I just like big, large speakers. But that being said, I'm also happy that it wasn't any larger because this kind of pushed the limits of the baffle that I'm able to test on. I think if it were too much larger, I wouldn't have been able to test it at all. So for that reason, I'm happy. But I do wish it had some big old monster woofers. So maybe at some point, JBL will come out with like an eight inch version of this. I know they have other different in-wall synthesis speakers, but I would be stoked to see the exact same thing in a eight inch woofer or even a six and a half inch woofer version of this. But that being said, it does pretty darn good for what it is. I mean, even though it's not a huge monstrous loudspeaker, these four, Woofers, these four five and a quarter inch woofers, do a great job in terms of output fidelity. They're still gonna need a subwoofer. We'll talk about that in the data in a little bit. But with the compression being what it is and the distortion being so low, yeah, they really don't have a problem. So you don't necessarily need a whole lot of big bass drivers. And the other thing to keep in mind is that when you're using in wall speakers, you've got the effect of the baffle loading the bass as opposed to a standard loudspeaker where you would put it out into a room well you don't have the effect of the the bass drivers being loaded by the rear wall behind it you probably experience something like this looks kind of like when you corner load a subwoofer right you know that if you take a subwoofer and put it out into a room it's not going to have as much bass as it does when you corner load it and that's because the surrounding walls relative to the wavelength kind of build up and reinforce that sound at lower frequencies. And you basically get the same effect when you mount a speaker into a wall. Now you mount a speaker on a wall, that's gonna be a different video, that's not good. But you mount a speaker into a wall, everything on the wall is the baffle. So the, the wall becomes essentially an infinite baffle. And therefore you get more bass reinforcement. So while I say that it would be cool to have an eight inch version or a six and a half inch version, honestly, you don't really even need that because you've got the wall acting as larger woofers. So that's cool. So with that said, we're just gonna go over a couple small things real quick. This is the one inch compression driver. This is using their HDI technology, which is their, what do they call it? The high definition imaging waveguide technology. Basically, it's a really good controlled directivity design. It controls the dispersion very, very well, horizontally and vertically. Then you've got, as I said, the four five and a quarter inch woofers. This is a two and a half way design. I don't recall exactly what the crossover is between the woofers. Now, the mids to the tweeter is around 1.8 kilohertz per spec, but I don't know where the woofers start to roll off so you don't have as much mid range in the top as you do in the bottom. Basically, these two work together in the base area, but then at some point, I'm making up a number here, maybe at like 500 hertz the mid-range starts to roll off on the top and the very bottom, and then the mid-range takes over on this guy. So that helps with added output and added sensitivity, and you typically find that in more sensitivity or, or higher sensitivity speakers. I'll flip it around to the back here, and you can see that this is the passive crossover, so this is all a fully passive unit, and it, it just looks incredible. Uh, the good thing that I liked about this is there aren't any rattles from any components rattling or anything like that. When you are shopping lower cost in wall speakers, make sure you keep that in mind because the last thing you wanna do is to install a speaker in your wall and find out that it's got some wires rattling or components are rattling because the manufacturer just didn't do a good job or didn't have the foresight to think about that. That's not an issue here and that's a great thing to have. I'll also roll around the side and you can see, where is it? Oh, right here the spring-loaded terminals, so that's cool. You just pop the spring-loaded terminals down, put the speaker wire in, and you're ready to go. Now, the way that this installs into the wall is you do your cutout, you slip this into the wall, and then you tighten up these Phillips head bolts 
And as you do that, there's a little flange that opens up and it clamps the wall. So it basically draws closer and closer to the wall and then it clamps it very sturdily to the wall. I'm doing this for my infinite baffle setup. I was really surprised at how well it holds. I walked around with the baffle piece for a while and there was no issues, no concerns at all about the speaker losing its place in that cutout. So that's, that's cool. Now the one bad thing about reviewing in-wall speakers is that to properly subjectively review them, you would pretty much have to put them in the wall. And that's just not feasible, guys. That's just not something that I can do. I did do kind of a sanity check where I took my baffle set up, I took it upstairs, and on my four foot diameter baffle, I just listened to the one speaker and basically just said, okay, does, does it sound good enough? You're not gonna have bass reinforcement below maybe a few hundred hertz. And the imaging from side to side isn't gonna be as good because then you get diffraction. So you get sound radiation from the edge of the baffle that I made myself. You don't have those things in a typical on wall or I should say in wall installation. So I did the best I could with subjective listening. And what I heard, I can tell you, I was very impressed by. I was actually considering buying the speaker down the road and my testing and my little quasi subjective listening told me that it's a it's certainly a good one to keep on the list. So it's gonna go at the top of the list for now. And then as I accumulate other tests, then we'll see where this one stands. But yeah, if you're looking at this speaker, I definitely think it's, it's one to check out. I also wanna say a huge thank you to Audio Advice. Now, I'm not sponsored per se by Audio Advice. I'm not getting paid for this review by Audio Advice, but Audio Advice was cool enough to work with me to allow me access to whatever they sell in their store. And all I gotta do in return is just provide you all with a link to their store. And in that way, you know, it helps them out. So they're helping me by allowing me to provide content for you all. So really they're doing the community a favor. And all I gotta do in return is just provide a link. Now the other thing I forgot to mention was there is a switch at the top for boundary near or far. And the typical situation would have you put in boundary far, that's the default setting. Boundary near is if you have a wall within two feet, so like a side wall of this speaker. And then that way, what that does is that kind of trims the base. So the base isn't too bloated because naturally there's a bit of a mid base bump in the response. So we'll see that in the data as well. And then this is the grill. You can paint it and then it's magnetically attached. That's kind of close enough for now. I'm only holding it with one hand, but you get the idea. And it holds well. I did do testing with the grill on. We'll talk about that as well. But suffice it to say, the response is better with the grill off. So that's the upfront information. Let's go ahead and start looking at the data and then we'll get you all up out of here. All of the data that we're about to look at was captured with my Clippold near fill scanner. But in this case, it was using the baffle module on a baffle that I built. I actually have a video that discusses this more in detail and explains how the Clippold machine is able to determine basically the boundaries of the baffle and give us infinite baffle or two pi radiation of the speaker as if it were in a true infinite baffle. I'll put that up here. So that means that everything you're about to see is based on it being essentially in an infinite baffle, just like it would be if you put it in your room, but actually better. This data is also gonna be showing us with the far setting switched, and then I will have some other stuff later. This also does not have the grill. First things first, the CEA 2034 data. And what you see that stands out in a couple things, actually, uh, the base kind of stands out. It's about a plus 2 dB, plus 3 dB base bump. Then the treble has some things that kind of stand out that make you go, well, that doesn't look great. But if you go and look down here at the early reflections and even the sound power directivity indices, you can see that they're pretty much flat to the high frequency. Because it is part of the synthesis line, it is assumed or expected at least that you would be working with an installer and you would be using equalization to tailor these speakers to perform how you need them to perform in your room. So while the response isn't dead flat, there's a lot of things that are great about this response. And number one, it is the EQ ability. I mean, look how smooth this early reflections directivity index is from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. There's a lot of room in here for you to tailor the sound however you wanna tailor it. But without that, the response actually looks pretty good. I'd say it's about plus or minus one and a half dB for the mid range. And then when you get to the extremes, that's when it jumps out. 
And you can see that to be the case here. The gray box kind of bounds the average sensitivity. And the average sensitivity is at about 91 dB, which is good to have for a speaker like this because you're gonna want dynamic range with the speaker that you're using for home theater. If you look through the mid range, you can see that yes, indeed, the speaker is about plus or minus one and a half dB. And for the most part, it's within plus or minus three dB, except for this extreme dip around 10 kilohertz. But as I said, those aren't really issues to me because the speaker does have excellent EQ ability. This is the estimated in-room response. And then this is me drawing a trend line through that estimated in-room response. Now the trend line is kind of biased up toward the higher frequencies in this case, then this is just me kind of manually doing this. But if I were to assume that I was gonna use EQ, then this trend line would go a lot more smoothly right through this mid range and continue on through the high frequency. And once again, I wanna remind you, this speaker can be EQ'd. Now, that's a big selling point. And sometimes it can be used as an excuse for a speaker that doesn't look great out of the box. But having talked with the actual designer of the speaker, their intent was, a speaker with good linearity, good dynamic range, but good EQ ability. And if you've been around this game long enough, then you probably already know that it's hard to get all three of those. But when you design a speaker to make realistic compromises for each of those, then you can come up with a speaker that can sound great once it's installed in the room and equalized to taste. Another aspect to consider is this is assumed to be with the listener dead on axis. Whereas most stereo setups would have the speakers installed in a wall at about 30 degrees or so. Now the center channel is still gonna provide this kind of estimated interim response, but again, EQ ability. This is the SPL horizontal response as you go from on axis to off axis. And the thing I wanna point out here is once again, EQ ability. I feel like I'm just taking a hammer and hammering that down, EQ ability over and over. But that's important to understand about this speaker. Now, most speakers that show on axis peaks and dips, I would say the large majority of them do not behave linearly off axis. And what I mean by that is if you're listening on axis, there may be a dip in the response, but as you go off axis, that dip turns back into a more flat line. So most coaxial speakers, most waveguided speakers are designed to be listened to at about maybe 15 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees, off axis because those speakers tend to exhibit some on axis peaks and dips. So naturally when I saw this data, I thought, well, that's that's not great. You're telling me that I'm gonna have to listen to the speaker off axis. But when I dove a little bit further into the horizontal, I actually saw something that was a good thing. And that is these dips track and these peaks track as you go off axis, which means that you can EQ those to taste. You can flatten this response out with a few well-placed parametric EQ bands. And I'm not necessarily sure that you need to even flatten it out, but it's good to know that this speaker behaves probably just as good on axis as it does off axis. And it's up there with some of the better performing speakers in that regard. Also something to note about this particular speaker is the beaming doesn't occur until you're about 1500 Hertz. And what do I mean by that? Well, that basically just means that the Radiation pattern is pretty much the exact same, omnidirectional, if you will, from zero hertz, well, I guess in this case, 20 hertz, to 1500 hertz. And then once it gets to 1500 hertz, then the things start to kind of spread out as you go off axis. Whereas most speakers, especially speakers like this with the RAID woofers, they're gonna start having beaming issues where the directivity changes even lower in frequency and it can shift from broad to narrow back to broad again if it's a poor design. Being that this is an infinite baffle type setup speaker where it's intended to go in the wall, you get that extra boundary loading all the way up to 1500 Hertz. So the speaker doesn't become directional until then. Basically, whatever you hear on axis, you're definitely gonna hear 30 degrees off axis at least, at least until 1500 Hertz. And then if we look at this 30 degree mark, we can see that this follows impeccable off axis linearity with respect to the on-axis response. And this kind of shows us the same thing, right? This is just a globe plot, and this is the frontal hemisphere of the speaker, zero degrees is dead on-axis with the tweeter, and then we have to the right of the speaker and to the left of the speaker, and we can see that it's about plus or minus 40 degrees as you go above the mid-range, so above about, what is that, two kilohertz or so? Then it starts to narrow up, and that's the same thing that we saw in this data. Now this is the vertical response, this would be your ears sitting dead on axis out here at zero, 
and then this would be above the speaker, and then this would be below the speaker directly at 90 degrees. And what we see here is the radiation shifts, okay? So we're at about plus or minus 15 degrees for the majority of the radiation pattern up and down until you get to about 1.3, 1.5 kilohertz or so. And then the radiation jumps out to a broader radiation pattern. Now, in an ideal world, I don't know that that's what you want. Frankly, the verdict is still kind of out on vertical radiation, but the key takeaway from this data really is that when you install the speaker, you want to install it no more than, I would say maybe 10 degrees above or below the primary listening position, because if you place it beyond those limits, then you're not gonna hear the same kind of timbre as you should be as you go further above or below the speaker. Basically, if you're having additional rows of seating, keep this in mind, or if you're using these as surround speakers, keep this in mind. You're gonna to wanna to put that tweeter at or approximately at your ear level. This is the distortion at 86 dB. Everything looks good except for this little guy. He's starting to stand out. And then at 96 dB, again, everything looks good except for this guy standing out. Now it's a second order harmonic distortion at about, we're gonna just ballpark it at about 1.7 kilohertz. And it's most likely due to the tweeter compression driver, but can you hear it? I didn't hear it in my just kind of goofing around, subjective listening. I'm not even gonna call it like a real subjective evaluation because like I said earlier, those things are hard to do, but it's not something that stood out to me. I can tell you that. Now, is it ideal? No, it's not ideal, but do I think that you're gonna be able to hear it? I don't know. As data junkies, we tend to see things like this and go, oh my God, it's the end of the world. But you've got to realize that all the other strengths that this speaker is playing to. Um, so with all of that said, if I were buying the speaker, would I worry about it? No, that doesn't make me worry about it. Now here's another place where this speaker really shines and that is the compression linearity testing. You can see that this speaker doesn't really suffer any compression that's notable until you get to around, I'm gonna say about 80 Hertz, right? And when I say notable, I'm looking at like half a dB to a dB, and when it gets beyond that at high output volumes, then I would say, well, that's not a good thing. But given that this speaker is intended to be used with a subwoofer, all of this right here on the low end, that's moot. That's not important. It's irrelevant at this point. So the main areas that we want to focus on are, I'm just going to say 80 hertz and above. And I would say that this data looks really good for this speaker. I mentioned earlier that I did some additional testing. And the first test I did was with the grill on. Now, what I'm gonna show you again is the far setting with the grill off. Now, this is the baseline that we've already seen. And now this is the response with the grill on. And if I toggle between the two again, you can see how smooth the directivity indices are and how, you know, well, comparatively smooth the on axis response is compared to when you put the grill on and see how the response up here is jumping around, but more notably, the directivity index, they're just bouncing all over the place. That means that you're not gonna be able to EQ this speaker to taste into high frequencies like you can without the grill. Now let's go back to the initial far setting, and we're gonna look at what happens when you switch the flip over to near, but both of these are without the grill. That's the near setting. This is the far setting again, near setting. All right, so the main difference is just this boundary reinforcement that you're gonna have when you have the near setting placed on. And that's it for this review. I hope you appreciate it. I hope you learned something. If you would like to support, you can do so a number of ways. I've got a Patreon set up, patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. Or if you are interested in this speaker, or if you're interested in any other speakers that Audio Advice happens to sell, please kick, kick, please click my affiliate link below. Purchase whatever it is that you need to purchase because that will give me, I think, four or 6% of a commission without any additional cost to you. And if you hate affiliate links and you think my review is biased, then pay no attention to all this stuff and good luck finding somebody else that's doing this kind of information for you. With that said, I am out. I will talk to y'all later. Peace.